Uh, no, I haven't changed my mind, but I think uh, change comes slowly. So I think at some point, um, if you look at contracts, they are really paper documents that are intended to capture um, promises or other commitments made at a particular time and place. And that's their value, their physical, their, their actual substance, their tangible. Uh, and we assume that if somebody signs a document and it has a date that, you know, recognized on according to procedure, then we can tell what was going on at a particular time. But uh, times change. And uh, what happens if you uh, have uh, communications capabilities that are different from this tangible piece of paper? Um, because not all communications media, uh, you know, by their inherent nature, guarantee that they're reliable. That they don't get. Are, are we need to invent ways to make sure that we trust them. Mm -hmm. uh, and these, this trust is sort of inherent in paper, even if we sign our signature to them, and, and there's no reason really to to be very trustworthy. Uh, so, what happens when the medium becomes different? Uh, the medium has different capabilities. It's, it's intended to do the same thing, but it does it differently. And it could capture uh, beliefs over time. Mm -hmm. uh, then it becomes a more dynamic rather than a, a physical or tangible object. And uh, if times change, or if we want to change our minds about something, we can renegotiate things, and this is reflected in the contract, and uh, it just becomes something different. Okay. So I still think that's the future. Um, it's hard to, hard to turn, look around and, and find examples of it, uh, but I think it's still inevitable. Uh, probably not. Uh, the other thing I predicted that hasn't come about was uh, really the weakening of the legal profession. Uh, or at least uh, I thought change would occur to lawyers much more quickly than it, than it has. Mm -hmm. So some things have changed uh, very, very quickly. Uh, capabilities for purchasing things, consumer uh, items. Uh, some things we we know we can use the web for, but we may not. Uh, we may have to think hard before we actually realize. Oh yeah, we could use the web for that. We don't have to do it the old way. But it's not instinctive necessarily. Uh, and there are other reasons, for example, why lawyers are still a powerful force. But um, you know, it depends how you define uh, <laughs> revolution. <laughs> I, I've uh, certainly, things are changing. Uh, and you know, in the, yeah, I'd say in the commercial retail world, maybe it's been a revolution. Amazon buying a book has been a revolution. Um, educational institutions like this, I don't think you find very many revolutions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a hard question because I haven't thought about evidence very much. Okay. Uh, evidence, uh, evidence is uh, the rules of evidence are part of uh, a formal court process, and uh, frankly, most of my work lately has involved um, methods of resolving disputes out of court, where uh, you don't have rules of evidence. Probably that's one of the attractions <laughs> of, of um, trying to do things out of court. But I think uh, if you have a, a general attitude towards in information that uh, it's more and more difficult to control the production and flow of information, then one would think there will be some challenges in some way that I'm not able to identify 
have some challenges to the rules of evidence. And rules of evidence are one of the primary mechanisms that are employed to, to ma for judges to manage uh, the use of information. If you look at, uh, as I do, uh, almost every dispute resolution process, maybe other than war, is a communications process, and they differ from each other uh, by the manner in which information is managed. Uh, then rules of evidence are on one extreme, very formal, very uh, you know, that, that they give authority to judges to make decisions. Less formal systems like mediation, uh, nobody really is, uh, you know, has that kind of formal control. Well, I think uh, in terms of recent books, or fairly recent books, or the one I've read fairly recently that I think about a lot, uh, which is probably a good way of uh, valuing a book, uh, I'd say John Zittrain's book, uh, The Future of the Internet, and I think How to Stop It. Uh, I, I think that's a, a serious, provocative book. And an uh, 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 interesting comparison, an uh, interesting framework for looking at, at change. Uh, his framework, as you may know, involves looking at technologies which users can be creative with and technologies which users can't be creative with. Um, Steve Jobs, who passed away a few weeks ago, um, actually has a central role in his book, Jobs was rightly so, uh, depicted as a very creative, imaginative uh, designer, uh, but he was in full control of the technology, so, you know, originally at least, um, and still, you know, the Apple iPhone is a closed box and uh, differs from you know, other, uh, other kinds of uh, phones, which are more open. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the train's curious about that phenomenon and um, I think makes some important points because uh, frankly, I mean the thing you haven't asked me about was um, you know whether my books uh, written 15 and 20 years ago, whether they were optimistic and, and whether I'm disappointed at how things have turned out. That would have been a fair question. Uh, and I probably was more optimistic uh, than I should have been. And Citrin points out that most people writing at that time, well, we had all these extraordinary new uh, capabilities presented to us. Who would think that, you know, spam would arrive? Or I think pornography we knew would come, and probably copyright violations. But uh, spam and, and all kinds of other things, uh, identity theft. Uh, consumer fraud. That was a disappointing phenomenon that we hadn't really anticipated.